Welcome to Star Wars Reads Day, hosted by the Airdrie Public Library. My name is Don Haladiak, and I'm a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Calgary Centre. Today we are celebrating Star Wars and all the wonderful worlds it introduced us to. Let's go back to May 1977 when the very first movie was released, and there we were introduced to the hero, Luke Skywalker, living on this dry planet called Tantooine. This planet orbited a binary star system, and you can see two stars or two suns setting in the distance. In the next movie, which was later labeled Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back, the rebels had to take refuge on a cold, icy planet called Hoth. If we go back to another trilogy, Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, there we see the Empire has set up a, a base on this stormy water planet called Camino. As an astronomer, I'd like to ask, could these worlds exist? Could these very interesting and different worlds really be out there in our galaxy or in another galaxy far, far away? This is a picture of our solar system, our planetary system, the only one we know a lot about. The sun's in the middle and the inner planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars are very close to the sun. The outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are much further away. But we know our planetary system has eight planets, five dwarf planets, well over 200 moons, about a million asteroids, and uh, just under 3,700 comets. Now, how can we find other planets around other stars? Well, first, let's just think of where our sun is. Our sun is one of billions of stars that exist in our Milky Way galaxy and this view is looking from the top of our pinwheel shaped galaxy looking down and our sun and the planets um, exist in the outer arm of the milky way now all those other stars billions of stars they themselves could also have planets but how can we find them since they're so far away and so tiny they would be very difficult to resolve in a telescope well, we need telescopes, and there are some big ones that we can use. Here's one at uh, near Pritis called the Rothney Astrophysical Observatory, operated by the University of Calgary. And astronomers can look at a star and watch its light that, uh, that is emitted from the star. And here's a diagram showing you the star as a yellow circle, and then a planet, an exoplanet, passing in front of it. And if you look at the bottom, you can see time progressing to the right and as the planet passes in front of the star it dips it'll slightly block the light from the star and this is what astronomers are looking for to try and find uh, exoplanets or distant planets not only telescopes on the ground are used but also space telescopes this one is called kepler now, it was launched uh, several years ago, and it stared at a patch of the Milky Way galaxy for many, many months and looked at about 150,000 stars looking for those light levels to drop. And these drops in light level give us an indication that there might be a planet orbiting that star. And these planets are called exoplanets, planets that are orbiting another star far, far away. And so far, if we are keeping a record of this, there are about 4,276 confirmed planets as of September 2020. And there are over 2,000 more waiting to be confirmed. Now let's look at some of the interesting worlds or exoplanets that have been discovered so far. The first one I'm going to talk about is called OGLE 2016 BLG 1195 LB. And it is a world that is roughly 13 
thousand light years away from us. And that means traveling at the fastest known speed that we know, the speed of light, that light started 13,000 years ago and is just reaching us here on Earth. And when you think about it, 13,000 years ago, we were Calgary was still under an ice age, so it's taken a long time for that light to reach us. And these images of the next few exoplanets I'm going to show you are just artist drawings or renditions because no telescope can give us this clear of an image. But back to this exoplanet. It's far away from the Earth, and it orbits a star that is only about 8% the size of our, or the mass of our Sun, which means there is very little heat and light given off that star to heat up this world, even though it's about the same size as the Earth and roughly the same distance from its Sun as the Earth is from our Sun, it is just so, the, the, there's just so little heat and light uh, reaching it, that it must be a very cold and icy world, very similar to the world Hoth that we saw in Star Wars. This next exoplanet is called Kepler 16b, discovered in 2011 by the Kepler Space Telescope. It is located roughly 200 light years from Earth and it orbits a binary star system. If there was any life on this planet, looking out at the, the sky, they would see two stars or two suns in the sky. And just like that scene in episode four, A New Hope in Star Wars, where we watched Luke Skywalker uh, watching the two suns setting, this world would be very similar to a planet like Tantooine that we saw in Star Wars. This next exoplanet is called Kepler 22b, also discovered in 2011. And this planet is roughly 500 light years away from the Earth, and it exists in what we call the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone. And what we mean by this, that uh, it's at the right distance from the star that it orbits around for liquid water to exist. If it was too close to the star, it'd be too hot and the water would boil away. If it was too far from the star, it'd be too cold and the water would be frozen. So in that Goldilocks zone, it's just right for liquid water to exist. In this world, if we look at the Star Wars analogy, this might be very similar to the planet that we saw in episode two, Attack of the Clones, Camino, a water world. Now we don't have time to go through all 4,000 exoplanets. However, I'd like to end with this one and it's called Trappist 1F and it's only 39 light years from Earth. So it's quite close to us. And this planet is one of seven planets orbiting a star. And it's very similar to our solar system, as we have eight planets, and this, is, this star system has seven planets. And TRAPPIST-1F is again located in what we called that Goldies, Goldilocks zone, or the habitable zone, where liquid water could exist on this planet. And it's very, you know, fascinating to think that there could be life on this world only 39 light years away from us. Well, another scene in Star Wars I'd like to talk about, and that's uh, episode five, when the Empire Strikes Back. If you remember, there's a scene where the Millennium Falcon is being chased by the uh, Imperial TIE fighters, and it's dipping and diving and going, you know, veering uh, left and right, trying to avoid these asteroids. So what do we know about asteroids, and are they important? Well, we know asteroids here in our planetary system anyways, is that they exist, but most of them exist between Mars and Jupiter, and we call this the asteroid belt. Now, if you were to go and stand on an asteroid in our asteroid belt, you would have a hard time trying to just even see the next asteroid. Space is big and asteroid belts are quite sparsely populated um, in comparison to what we might see in, say, a movie like Star Wars, where they're having to avoid uh, colliding with all these space rocks. Um, movies try, uh, I think, embellish a little bit more about how uh, asteroid belts are populated and 
uh, this is quite a bit different, at least in our solar system. So why is it important to study asteroids? Well, asteroids are like time capsules. They formed at the very same time as the planets were forming in our solar system. But planets can have erosion and plate tectonics where they recycle rocks, whereas asteroids can preserve those early conditions from the time the solar system formed. And we can learn about what, what you know, how our solar system formed. Also, asteroids and comets may have brought a lot of the water that we have on our planet, which makes us quite unique compared to all the other planets in our solar system. So they could be one of the reasons why we're here as life as we know it. And finally, asteroids can also be a source of extreme danger. If you go back 65 and a half million years ago, a large asteroid, perhaps uh, about 10 kilometers in diameter, struck the Yucatan Peninsula and caused the dinosaur extinction, a mass extinction event. So not only can asteroids bring or uh, you know, be the cause of life to start on another world, they can also be the source of its demise, its destruction. One of the best ways to learn more about asteroids is actually to go out and orbit around them. And NASA launched this spacecraft called Dawn back in 2007 on a long journey towards the asteroid belt, where it went into orbit around the asteroid Vesta, and then it fired up its engine again and went around into orbit around uh, a dwarf planet called Ceres. The dwarf planet Ceres makes up about 25% of the mass of all the asteroids in the asteroid belt. So it's a very large object. And not only that, it's always been a puzzle to astronomers, as even from telescopes on Earth, you could see that it had some white splotches on it, like what would cause these markings? So it was very exciting for when Dawn went into orbit uh, in around Ceres back in 2015 and uh, stayed there until uh, in operation until about 2018, it sent back some new information about this mysterious planet. When Dawn, the spacecraft, arrived there, it was able to take the look at the light and the spectra and determine that these are, are salts and maybe a result of an underground uh, slushy type ocean that may have come through um, uh, cracks or fissures and erupted onto the surface. And as water reaches the surface and in a vacuum of space, it would boil away, leaving behind some of these salty remnants that are now exposed on the surface of white patches. And this process may still be going on today. Quite exciting. Now, there's another mission that's ongoing right now, and it's called OSIRIS-REx for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, and Regolith Explorer. That's what OSIRIS-REx stands for. NASA likes their acronyms. So here I am standing uh, very close to OSIRIS-REx, and um, Canada has a, an involvement in this mission that it's provide a laser altimeter, which is very important for mapping and uh, uh, studying the asteroid. And also this mission is to bring back a sample of an asteroid back to Earth. You can see the white capsule there in, on top of the spacecraft in the right-hand photo. Mm. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft launched on an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral, Florida on September the 8th, 2016. It arrived around asteroid Bennu on December 2018 where it began using its uh, LIDAR radar system and uh, laser altimeter provided by Canada, the instrument's called OLA, to select a sample point as the mission, the prime mission here is to bring a sample of this carbonaceous chondrite asteroid back to Earth. If all goes as planned, OSIRIS-REx will begin to descend to the surface of asteroid Bennu on October 20th. There it will touch the surface of the asteroid for 5 to 10 seconds, where a blast of nitrogen will try to disturb the surface of the asteroid called a regolith and place it into its little sample container.
if the spacecraft can collect at least 60 grams of asteroid material, it will place the sample container into a, a sample return canister and uh, begin its uh, return journey back to Earth where it will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere in September of 2023 and land in uh, Utah, the United States. Now, because Canada provided the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter, or OLA, Canada will receive a portion of the sample that was collected from this asteroid surface here. And what you're looking at here is an animated sequence of a rehearsal um, of going down close to the surface and just stopping prior to touching the surface just to make sure that everything was working properly. So an exciting time will uh, occur on October the 20th. Now let's talk about meteors and meteor rites. When you look up on a clear night and you see a flash of light in the sky, it could be a meteor. And these are tiny grains of uh, sand-sized particles, maybe even pebble size, that when they slam into our atmosphere, they're traveling so fast, they release their energy by heat and light. So we get to see these little flashes of light in the sky. And if they're big enough, they'll actually survive the fiery entry and land onto the surface of the Earth as a meteorite. Now, if the meteoroid entering our atmosphere, which produces a bright meteor or fireball, if it's exceptionally bright, and it's the size of, say, a beach ball, some of the fragments may survive the re-entry into our atmosphere. And when they land onto the surface of the Earth, they're called a meteorite, something that you can pick up. And these are actually pieces from the asteroid belt. Very exciting. Here I am uh, marking the location of a meteorite found in Saskatchewan, part of the Buzzard Cooley Fireball, observed back in November 2008. The first pieces were discovered about a week later, and this was widely observed from Alberta to Manitoba because it was around dinner time and people were driving home from work and saw this bright flash in the sky. Back in February of 2013, an even larger meteoroid, perhaps 10 to 20 meters in size, which is equivalent to one or two school buses in size, came onto a shallow trajectory into the Earth's atmosphere and produced a super bolide brighter than the sun and dropped thousands of fragments over a city in Chelyabinsk, Russia. In the future, astronauts may be sent to asteroids and small moons around other worlds to look at the resources of these asteroids. Of many asteroids, if they contain any hydrous type minerals that, that contain water, can be used to make rocket fuel or even oxygen to breathe. So asteroids in the future, their resources could be very valuable to future explorers. In the not too distant future, astronauts will be making uh, journeys to even more distant worlds beyond the moon and towards Mars and even some of the moons around the large planets like Jupiter and Saturn. As the human race starts exploring deeper into our own solar system and starting to live on other worlds, we will require habitats, uh, places to live as shown in this diagram of a 3D printed uh, house on the surface of Mars. And soon after the first landing on Mars, there'll be even larger spacecraft carrying up to 100 astronauts at a time to the red planet. And there we will need astronauts of varying skills, construction workers, computer programmers, uh, um, scientists, doctors, teachers, to help start a new civilization on the red planet Mars.
And this brings my presentation to a close. I want to thank you for your attention and interest in Star Wars and space exploration. And always remember, may the Force be with you. Thank you.